All right, let's talk now about what is science and how is it different from other ways of knowing about the world. Science isn't the only way to know things. Uh, but there are some specific rules for something to qualify as science. Just putting the word science in something doesn't make it science. Political science, not really science. Social science, some of it is science, some of it is not science. So let's talk about how do you tell if something is science or not uh, and the basic scientific process. Science only deals with the natural world, and in fact, it's the best way we know of to figure out how things in the physical world work. We look for next explanations of natural phenomena, everything from, you know, how does the sun work, to where are comets coming from, to how things in a cell function. For something to be part of science, ideas have to be testable. We have to think of a way that we could test our ideas. Uh, data has to be objective, and we'll talk about what that means, and measurable. So empirical, you may have heard that term before, empirical data. Empirical data just means it's a number. It's something we measured, like the temperature outside. Results have to be repeatable by other scientists. If you get results, even if they're really uh, wonderful and exciting, and no one else can repeat your results, something's wrong. You did something wrong. You, re you reported how you did the experiments wrong. Something needs to be examined there. So other people need to be able to repeat the results. Uh, things that are a matter of opinion, like morality, ethics, religion, we cannot address these issues with the scientific method. They are other ways of knowing about the world. So what is objective? So we, we want objective data in science. So if something is objective, it means that any two observers are going to get the same answer. That's objective. Like if I give everybody a thermometer and I say go outside and find out what temperature it is. There might be a little bit of variation, but pretty much everybody's going to have the same answer. Um, but if I ask you uh, go outside and then come back and tell me if you think it's hot or cold or uh, comfortable or too windy, you know, what did you think of what it was outside? Now we're subjective uh, because everybody is going to have a different answer for that question and it could change over time depending on the observer the answer could change. Like if you've just been running and you ran from your car to get to class you might not think that it's cold outside but if you've been sitting and studying for two or three hours now you might think that it's cold outside and that outside is exactly the same temperature. Um, so that would be subjective, not objective. So uh, one of the things to ask in when we're trying to evaluate whether something is objective is ask, are we actually measuring something? What is our data going to look like? If our data is an opinion, then it's not actually objective data. Um, so if we're measuring something, that's what we like in science. We want numbers. Even if we're looking at something like behaviors, we want to count how many times that behavior occurs or how long that behavior lasts or how many individuals in the population have that behavior. There's always something to count. Uh, but if we're asking if something is aesthetically pleasing, uh, you know, which is the most beautiful painting in the art museum, that's not a question that is objective because different people will have different opinions. We can often turn those subjective questions though into something objective. Like for example, instead of asking what is the most beautiful painting in the art museum, we could ask which painting do people spend the most time standing in front of? And we could set up motion detectors and we could measure which painting do people spend the most time standing in front of? And that's not exactly the same question, but it's close. Uh, we could find out which painting people like to look at the most because they're spending the most time doing it. There's two main different categories of scientific data, observational and experimental. And this is often a misunderstanding of people outside of science. They think that only experimental data counts. And if you can't do experiments on something, then you can't 
study it in a scientific way. Like, we can't know anything about dinosaurs because you can't do any experiments on them. And that's not true. We, there is a lot of data in science that is observational. Uh, somebody who's studying the sun, for example, they can't do any experiments with the sun, but you can still collect data in a scientific way. Um, and that's observational. So uh, on the left here, we have Jane Goodall, one of the most important scientists of the 20th century. Uh, her actually, her lab is, and her research still goes on, only she's not doing a lot of it anymore. She has a lot of graduate students and postdocs that are continuing her research in Tanzania with chimpanzees. Um, she started her work in the 1960s. And she w discovered a lot of amazing things by doing nothing other than observing chimpanzees. She was the first person to just watch them day after day after day until they became accustomed to her presence and they started acting normally around her. Uh, and so she discovered some amazing things. She discovered probably the most stunning thing that she discovered is that chimpanzees make tools. Before her discovery in the 1960s, it was thought that we were the only species on the planet that makes tools. There's a lot of species that use something as a tool. So a monkey picking up a rock and using it to smash a nut, they're using a tool. They're using something that's not part of their body. Uh, but chimpanzees actually alter natural objects to make them a better tool. And that the list of tool making species is very, very short. Uh, and it includes chimpanzees, uh, us, and probably many of our extinct direct ancestors. And it also includes elephants, dolphins, um, and a couple species of birds make tools. Uh, and there are many, many more species than that that use tools but don't modify those natural objects. So just using observations, she uh, really um, generated a bombshell in science. Um, one of her other big discoveries was that um, chimpanzees are not vegetarians. Uh, not only do they eat insects, which makes them omnivores right there because insects are animals, but they also kill and eat small animals. They kill and eat lizards and small monkeys and rip them apart and eat their flesh raw. And that was something that was absolutely not known. And uh, it changed the way that uh, we feed chimpanzees in zoos. We give them occasional higher protein treats um, that they didn't used to give them because they thought they mostly just ate plants. Um, on the other side here, on the right, is Franz de Waal. And he also studies primates. And he's also very interested in human evolution and uh, he though does experiments to figure that out. Instead of observing animals in the wild, he has uh, his monkeys, they don't live in these small cages like you see here in the photo. Uh, instead they live in a huge outdoor aviary um, because he wants them to have as natural a behavior as possible. And then they did just come into these little test chambers uh, when they're going to be in an experiment, he doesn't do any experiments that are painful or anything. They're just, um, uh, uh, what, would you, what do we want to say, behavioral experiments uh, to try to learn things. He's very interested in um, the evolution of uh, uh, emotional intelligence and uh, morals and morality. And he wants to see any bits of what we consider morality in animals. Um, so he doesn't just study monkeys, he also has some parrots and um, uh, dogs that he does experiments with. Okay, so uh, Franz Wall. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys. And uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber, 
for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. So um, that's part of one of his TED Talks, if you're interested in primate behavior experiments like that. Uh, I think he has three TED Talks now. So check it out. Uh, so deductive reasoning is something that has been documented for about 3,000 years. The ancient Greeks have the oldest documented deductive reasoning, but of course probably humans have been doing this for tens of thousands of years. We just, it's, it wasn't written down, so it's not documented. Uh, deductive reasoning is a part of science, but alone it isn't science yet. Uh, another way to describe deductive reasoning is uh, thought experiments, Using logic, um, just mathematics by itself is deductive reasoning. Uh, things that make sense. This is how we generate hypotheses in science. But that's not the end. You can't do a thought experiment and figure out what's going to happen if you did a real experiment. And often, hypotheses are wrong. So that is another reason why we need to test them. Uh, one of the people who use this deductive reasoning this uh, was Aristotle. He might be the most famous human who ever existed because more people alive today have heard of him than almost any other ancient person. Uh, he tried to figure out a lot of things about how the natural world worked. He was right about some things. Like one of the th things that he was crazy that he was right about this was that solids uh, are made out of tiny, uh, uh, tiny little bits that are too small to see, which we would now, now call atoms or molecules. Uh, he said, you know, every solid object is made of uh, millions of teeny tiny little things too small to see. Well, that's pretty good, pretty good deducing there. But um, and one thing that he was famously wrong about was gravity. He deduced with his thought experiment that the speed of a falling, falling object was proportional to its weight, which sounds, it's still to us today, even though probably most of you had high school physics, it sounds really rational. Our monkey brains really like the idea that heavy objects fall faster than light objects. And if you're saying, that, what? That's not true? No, it is not. It, if there's uh, air resistance is a factor for sure, but it is not true that heavy objects fall faster than light objects. Gravity is a constant. So how that was determined was using inductive reasoning. And that's what science does. So once you have your hypotheses, you have to test them. 
And you can even test a hypothesis in an observational science. So somebody who studies, you know, baboons, uh, for example, who's just observing them and not actually bringing them into a lab and doing experiments, they can make predictions about what the baboons are going to do in a particular situation. And then when that situation occurs, were they right or not right? So you can still test hypotheses even in an observational science. Um, we can even do it with things that are extinct. Scientists have many hypotheses about dinosaurs. One of the early hypotheses was that they were cold-blooded like reptiles. And the continued discovery of things about dinosaurs, it became quite clear that probably most, if not all, dinosaurs were some degree of warm-bloodedness, um, some probably even just as warm-blooded as birds that are alive today and us. So uh, you can use this testing of hypotheses even in an observational science. And the most important part of this is that if your hypothesis is not supported by the evidence that you find, you have to throw it away. And uh, that is sometimes hard to do if your hypothesis seems really logical and makes sense. But that is what we do in science. If your hypothesis is incorrect, we have to throw it away. Our conclusions and our new hypotheses, our latest hypothesis for something, has to be based on the latest data, the latest observations and experiments. And so science is always changing. And this is sometimes um, surprising, uh, to, sometimes to students especially, who mostly learn science as done. You know, this is the end. This is how things are. Learn these facts. And uh, then they're surprised w when we see science in process, like during the COVID pandemic, we have seen science in process as this new disease and the virus that causes it were discovered, described. We had many hypotheses in the beginning in spring 2020 that ended up being disproven. Like one of the hypotheses was that, oh, it doesn't seem like children really get it. Well, that turned out not to be true. Uh, so uh, things are constantly changing. And it doesn't, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing that scientists are constantly changing their minds based on the latest evidence. One of the first people that we consider a scientist was Galileo. And the reason is because he was testing hypotheses. And one of the things that he tested was um, uh, Aristotle's ideas about gravity. And he was the first person to prove experimentally that Aristotle was incorrect. And in fact, uh, gravity is a constant. And it doesn't matter what something's mass is they're going to fall at the same speed. Um, he famously dropped things off. He was um, Italian, and he lived in Florence. And Pisa is not that far away from Florence. And Pisa had the Leaning Tower, which is leaning since it was newly built. There were very few tall structures um, in the 1600s. Most of the tall structures were churches who were not a big fan of Galileo or him dropping cannonballs off of the steeple. So uh, Pisa was a great place for him to do some of his experiments. And he showed that, uh, he, which he did this experiment many, many, many times in front of audiences. And he proved that you could drop a cannonball and a musket ball, which are vastly different in size, but both spheres. And they would hit at the same time over and over and over. Now we know that some objects do fall slowly uh, because of air resistance. So a feather, if I had a feather and a marble that both weighed the same, the feather would fall slowly because it has a huge surface area and that creates wind res or air resistance so it would fall very slowly. Um, so if we eliminate the air, we should be able to see a feather and something heavy. Uh, fall fast. So this actually was done on one of the first um, moon missions. I think this was, I think this video is from Apollo 15. Uh, so uh, Kim, we copied a boat solar wind and a penetrometer drum in the ETB. Not quite yet. I haven't put the solar wind in yet, but I will shortly. I want to watch this. Oh, 
Okay. You have a, a good picture there. Be I've got the... Beautiful picture, Dave. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, that proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. So if you, the moon, of course, has no atmosphere. It's almost effectively a vacuum. Uh, so we don't get any air resistance with the feather. So a feather and a hammer, which way different. The hammer is much heavier than the feather in mass. Uh, and the feather also in the atmosphere would have air resistance, and they drop at exactly the same rate. Um, for those of you who've heard the conspiracy theories about uh, the moon landings all being fake and whatnot. Um, that was in the 1970s. I think that was uh, that particular video is from 1977. The first moon landing was in 1969. Go back and watch some science fiction movies from 1969. See the level of special effects that were possible in 1969. Watch the original Star Trek, uh, which is available on Paramount and clips are available on YouTube. Uh, and look at how absolutely horrible the special effects were. There was no technological capability in 1969 to fake a moon landing. It just wasn't possible. They weren't up to it. <laughs> so uh, moon landings were real. We left stuff on the moon that you could see with a telescope. Uh, so math all by itself is also not science. Uh, math is an extremely important tool in science. Uh, we use it even in biology. But all by itself, it's not data. Math is a, a type of deductive reasoning, like um, uh, what's used for generating hypotheses. But you still have to test it experimentally and collect data to show that your hypothesis is correct. Um, one of the current debates in math is about the existence of a multiverse. You might have heard about this. This is the idea that there's an infinite number of parallel universes and there's a slightly different you existing and living a slightly different life in millions, you know, some infinite number of parallel universes. Um, I heard a debate between a mathematician who specializes in this and a physicist and uh, the mathematician said, um, yep, the multiverse is real. My equations prove it. And the scientists asked him, do you have any data at all that's been collected in a parallel universe? Do you have any physical data that any, par any, any other universe exists at all? And uh, the mathematician well said, no, I don't need that because I have my equations. And the scientist said, then what you have is a hypothesis with no data yet. Um, it might be possible in the future to figure out a technological way to measure data, but right now it's a, scient it's a scientific hypothesis because it could be proven, it could be tested if we had the right technology. We currently don't even have the technology to figure out how to test it, but it's still a scientific hypothesis because it could be tested someday. But right now we have zero data. You can't prove something exists like parallel universes without a single data point. Equations don't prove anything. Uh, one of the most famous equations that ended up being proven in physics are Einstein's equations, which he had many. And even after, so he, uh, Einstein did no experiments. Everything he did was just in his head. After he published his equations, though, people immediately started testing them. And so far, all of Einstein's equations have um, survived testing and collection of data. Um, but 
so even Einstein had to be tested experimentally. So math alone is not data. Uh, scientific literacy is something that I hope you will get from this class, especially as they relate to various health claims. These are some examples of products. Uh, let me get my pointer here. Uh, products that make health claims, and there are many. You can't walk into a grocery store without seeing medical claims on food packages and supplements. So, uh, you know, this particular product here is claiming to do something for your digestive system. This one is, is kind of in sideways way trying to do something for your immunity. They both have the same exact thing in them, though. They just have live bacteria. It's just yogurt with live bacteria in it. Are they good for you? Possibly. But you'll notice they don't make any specific claims here. And that's a sign to you that they don't have any evidence. Or they would make a specific claim. So this just says immunity. And this actually, after COVID, this was taken off the market because they were accused by the FDA of trying to tell people that eating yogurt was going to keep people from getting sick. Uh, and so you won't see this one on the market anymore. Um, but they're actually not making a medical claim here. And this is a common tactic. They will put something on the label to let you jump to the conclusion without actually saying it. So just putting immunity. It says, help strengthen your body's defenses. That's a meaningless statement. Um, so no product can make a medical claim without evidence. So a medical claim is uh, claiming to treat or cure a disease or alter a part of the human body. So if they say, this supplement is going to increase your muscle mass that is a medical claim because they're claiming to change a part of the human body. So they have to be very careful not to make outright medical claims. So watch out for that. And we're going to talk more about this product, uh, which had to vastly change their packaging after they had a class action lawsuit against them about 20 years ago. But it's still on the market. Uh, so there's a lot of scientific stories and kind of pseudoscience sounding nonsense as well. Uh, and hopefully some of the information that you learn in this class will help you figure out how to find good information to figure out if those claims are um, possibly true or something that you should ignore. So ideally, the scientific process, um, and I say ideally because, you know, it doesn't always go exactly this way. Uh, you make an observation about the natural world, and you have a question. How, how does this work? So let's say I have some cells. The cells uh, need magnesium. Somehow, you know, I put magnesium in the culture dish, and magnesium ends up inside the cells. How is it being transported? How does it get inside the cells? That's my question. Well, I could think of two different hypotheses for that. I mean, this has five, but you know, sometimes you only have one. Uh, so for magnesium getting into the cells, maybe it's just diffusing passively across the membrane, or maybe there's a protein in the membrane that's transporting the magnesium into the cells. So those are my two hypotheses. So then I have to, a good hypothesis will naturally lead to prediction. So my prediction for that would be, all right, if I add something to the medium that blocks protein transport and it blocks magnesium from getting into the cell, then protein is needed to transport magnesium into the cell. Uh, then I do that experiment, and you know my two hypotheses are kind of opposites. So hopefully one of my hypotheses is canceled out. So I do my experiment. I add my protein transport blocking chemical to the media, and my cells don't get magnesium anymore. I have to have a control group of cells that don't get the treatment, and they do still get their magnesium inside the cells. So I know that the treatment that I did is what actually caused the result. So now I can reject the hypothesis that it's just diffusing across the membrane. Uh, but now I also need to do 
more experiments because you're, you're never actually done doing experiments, especially in biology. There's always more questions. And finally, though, you have one hypothesis which has held up through multiple experiments and you finally are ready to share your results. You're pretty sure now that this hypothesis is a good representation of what's actually happening and then you're ready to share it. And you do that by publishing your results. A good experiment has controls. So a control uh, or a controlled experiment, it means that we have an experimental group that gets the treatment and we have a control group that got no treatment. And then we, we can compare those two and we can tell them. So for my cells and their magnesium, I have my cells that got the chemical added and now they no longer get magnesium inside the cells. But I had a control group that was staying in, in exactly the same conditions, same media, same number of cells, same temperature. We try to make everything the same between the control group and the experimental group, except the treatment. And then if my control cells are still getting magnesium into the cells, I know it's not something like, you know, something went wrong in the incubator and all the cells are just sick and that's why they didn't take up any magnesium. So control groups are important and they're especially important in human medicine. Uh, so think about what would happen if we have uh, somebody has a new drug, maybe it's a repurposed drug from it used to be a blood pressure drug or something and now we think it might help depression because people who are being prescribed it for blood pressure suddenly say, you know what, my depression's better. So now we want to, and this actually, that actually happens all the time that they have a drug for one thing and the people who are, if it goes to market and people who are taking that drug uh, say, you know, I think it's helping this other thing too. Um, so how do we tell? Why why can't we just take this this drug and give it to a hundred depressed people and then come back in three months and see if they feel better? Why wouldn't that be a good experimental design? Um, and the reason is especially for something like depression or pain, those are kind of subjective. We don't have a test to tell. Uh, like we can't take a blood sample and tell if somebody's depressed. We can do that for a lot of things. Like if it's a blood pressure medicine, we're going to actually take their blood pressure and see if it got better. But for something like depression or pain level, uh, those are kind of subjective and we rely on the reports of the patients of how they feel and what their symptoms are. So uh, it, we really want to make sure that it's working. So instead, what we would do is take hundred people and give them the medication and we want another group of a hundred people who are the same in as many ways as possible as our experimental group same age same sex same uh, uh, income same age uh, as many different things that are the same as possible and then that second group is not going to get the treatment and for humans because humans can we know we're in a study and if you're not getting a pill, you know that you're in the control group. And so we don't want them to know that they're in the control group. So what do you do with the control group with people so they don't know they're in the control group? You give them a placebo. And that's the best way to tell if a drug works because the placebo effect is very strong. Uh, we now know that just bringing people into a lab uh, or an office setting, a medical setting, and having somebody with a white coat and a clipboard ask you a bunch of questions about how you're feeling, that alone makes people feel better. So we definitely want to make sure that any drugs we're using, any improvement we see, isn't just the placebo effect. So here's an experiment that was done on college students because many, um, many experiments are done on undergrads uh, at research universities. So this was done at the University of Minnesota about 20 years ago. And they wanted to test the old adage, uh, does being cold give you a cold? Does it make you sick? And you've all heard that. You know, you've heard, you know, probably your grandma, or your mom tell you, put on a hat, zip up your coat, you're going to get sick. So they wanted to test that, not extreme cold exposure, because we already know that extreme chronic cold stress does uh, reduce uh, the efficacy of your immune system, and you are more likely to get sick 
if you're chronically cold stressed. Like think of children living in, a, in an unheated house in the winter where they're just cold all the time. We already know that suppresses your immune system. So this was just like a single cold exposure. Um, so we need a hypothesis that's really specific and that we can test with a relatively short experiment. So the hypothesis that they came up with is if you get cold enough to shiver, you're more likely to come down with a cold in the next week. So they needed something that was less subjective than just feeling cold because feeling cold is again kind of subjective. We're relying like depression or pain. We're completely relying on the person to report that. So they wanted something external that the researcher could see so they would know this person was actually cold. So cold enough to shiver. That's pretty cold. You're pretty uncomfortable if you're actually teeth chattering, shivering. Uh, and, and more likely to come down with a cold in the next week. They were trying to make it a very time limited experiment. So the prediction from that is if we put people in a cold environment until they shiver, they will get more colds than the control group. See, got to have a control group. That's a controlled experiment. So they had college students. Um, they had a, only about 50 students in this experiment. They divided them randomly into two groups, and their randomness was important. The students did not know what kind of an experiment it was going to be. They only knew that discomfort was going to be involved. And why would they sign up for that? Because you get paid if there's discomfort involved. Usually all these students would have been part of an um, intro psychology class where you have to participate in experiments as part of the class. Um, and if any discomfort was involved, those were the only ones you got paid for. Um, and it's about $50 for usually about an hour or two. So uh, they get plenty of volunteers uh, for these experiments. So they divided them randomly into two groups. Um, they were just told what to wear, and it was Minnesota in the winter. So they were told to dress for exercise, you know, shorts and t-shirts. Uh, and then one group was sent outside, and the other group stayed inside. And when they were shivering, then they were allowed to come back in. So some people stayed out longer than others because depending on your body size and your metabolism, some people would get shivering and cold much faster than other people. Uh, and then they monitored them for cold symptoms for a week. And they monitored them by just having them fill out a questionnaire and asking them every day to fill out questions like, do you have a stuffed up nose? How many times today did you sneeze? Have, are you coughing? Do you have a fever? Have you been blowing your nose? All that kind of stuff. Um, and so what do you think the results were? Uh, there was no difference found between the control group and the experimental group. So getting cold just one time um, is not enough to make you sick. And it wouldn't even make you directly sick. You still have to be exposed to a cold virus in order to actually get sick. But, you know, on a college campus, that's, that's pretty easy to get exposed to a virus. Uh, science, uh, many important discoveries in science are made accidentally. And one of my favorite quotes about that is from uh, a science fiction author, not even a scientist, Isaac Asimov, who's been dead now for like 30 years. Uh, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but, hmm, that's funny. Uh, he was just fascinated by the fact that so many really important scientific discoveries were discovered by people who were looking for something else. Uh, like Röntgen uh, discovering x-rays by putting uh, photographic film next to a pile of rocks. <laughs> and those rocks had radioactive ore in them. Uh, uh, Fleming, who discovered penicillin, he was actually studying bacteria and got annoyed by all the uh, fungal uh, contaminations in his cultures that were killing all of his bacteria. And it took him years to realize that this could be used to treat bacterial infections. And these are just the most famous ones. Uh, people discovering things that they weren't looking for happens every day in science. And that's one of the reasons why what we call basic research is so important. Basic research means we're not uh, looking for anything specific. Like we're not trying to find a cure for multiple sclerosis or something. We're, we're just looking like, oh, how does this work? And just letting scientists kind of follow their noses and, and look at stuff that's interesting. Uh, and 
a lot, and they very often find things that nobody was actually looking for that end up being beneficial in terms of uh, medications for diseases or other things uh, that nobody nobody expected. We never know where what we're going to find. Science is also very collaborative. Um, this looks like a typical weekly lab meeting that I used to go to when I was working in research. And, uh, you know, poor graduate student up here at the board. Um, and, uh, you know, the old people here are probably the head researchers or PIs, as we call them, the primary investigators. And everybody else is graduate students and postdoc researchers. And uh, people would take turns uh, week by week talking about their experiments and what's gone right and what's gone wrong. And everybody would tell you what they thought you were doing wrong and criticize what you're doing and give you ideas and things that you should try. And Maybe you need a different control group for this. Have you heard of this person? You need to go talk to them. They're doing the same thing. So uh, by the time anybody in the public hears about any science, uh, it's already been, there's already been a lot of feedback to that researcher on that science, typically. When they don't do that, um, has often been some um, hilarious errors that have happened when scientists try to keep things too secret and don't allow people to criticize them. Uh, because the easiest person to fool is yourself. Uh, and scientists uh, have found that out the hard way before. So um, uh, letting other people hear your unpublished results, listening to the feedback, getting negative feedback from people all the time and positive feedback uh, is very good for the process of science. It helps keep uh, junk from eventually ending up before the public, uh, which is a good thing. Um, once scientists are ready to share their results, they publish it. And now most scientific journals are online. In fact, I think I would bet all scientific journals are online. And many of them don't even have a paper version anymore. But in biology, uh, I think all of the important scientific journals in biology still have a paper version as well. Um, so the, these are the two biggest general journals in science. Nature is a British publication. Science is the American publication. And uh, they publish a variety of different kinds of things, everything from anthropology, physics, chemistry, uh, population biology, all kinds of stuff. But there are many thousands of specialty journals. So for biology, there are journals like Cell and Development and uh, Biochemistry of the Cell and Neuron. Uh, there are just hundreds and hundreds of really good peer-reviewed journals. And if you see a reference to a journal and you're not sure if it's a peer-reviewed journal, you can find that information out pretty easily by Googling it. Uh, there are Wikipedia pages that have lists of peer-reviewed journals. Uh, some peer-reviewed journals are kind of fake peer review. They um, are pretty much like pay-to-publish journals, and they have reviewers that they send things to, but it's not real review. So one of the ways to tell those is by looking at the impact factor. And that's the impact factor is how often articles from that journal get cited in other journals as references. And if it has a really low impact factor, that's a sign that it might be a pay to publish um, journal, which would of course make the information in there suspect and less reliable. Um, for medicine specifically, like uh, general science, there are a whole bunch of general journals like JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, and then there's multiple general journals. And the biggest difference between these and a science journal is they publish information specifically related to human medicine. And they also publish things like case studies, which would be there's only one person, right? A case study would be something that has a weird case that somebody has uh, figured out. So they don't, we don't have anything like that in um, general science journals that would be a, equivalent to a case study. Um, and then there are thousands of, again, specialty medical journals 
for every disease you've ever heard of, there's probably multiple journals uh, for scientific papers um, related to research on those specific diseases. Uh, so if it's peer reviewed, what that means is that the, you send your paper to that journal with all the data and everything, and then they send it out to be reviewed by other scientists. Uh, you typically two or three is the normal number, but it could be as few as one, might be as many as five. And the key is that it is anonymous. And this means that the reviewers who may know the author can say whatever they want and be honest. Um, which is an important part of it. They, they toyed with the idea of getting rid of anonymous review a few years ago, and it was widely rejected by scientists. Scientists were like, no, we like anonymous review because you couldn't be honest if the, you're reviewing a, uh, a paper from somebody who you know. Maybe it's somebody you've collaborated with in the past. Maybe it's even a friend. So the scientists who review it are people in the same field. So you would want to have a reviewer who knew a lot about um, that particular topic. Um, and one of the problems going on right now is that uh, with reviewing papers, the scientists are so busy that their journals are having a hard time getting scientists to review papers for free. Uh, in the past, this reviewing uh, scientists, uh, it's been 100% uh, not for pay. Meanwhile, these journals are hugely profitable, and uh, one of the most profitable kinds of publications that exist are scientific journals because pretty much everybody is doing the work for free. The scientists aren't getting paid for articles that get published. In fact, they often pay a publication fee, um, and the reviewing and editing is being done by other scientists for free. Uh, so that's currently a controversy going on in science that perhaps reviewers need to be paid for their time. Uh, once it's been reviewed, it either gets accepted or rejected, uh, and sometimes it's accepted with conditions. They want you to do one more experiment. They want you to, this graph isn't easy to read. They want you to fix it. They want you to take better pictures or something. Um, and this process of peer review, and uh, it makes science self-correcting. Rarely do things get published that end up being retracted. Um, it does happen. Sometimes results are not repeatable by others, and that eventually we figure out there's been either sloppiness or deliberate fraud, um, but that's rare. Um, and we, the biggest one that happened recently was last year. It was discovered that two of the biggest Alzheimer's researchers had been faking data for 20 years. And they have the two, I hope they go to prison. The two of them have completely derailed Alzheimer's research. They faked data uh, to convince everybody that uh, the amyloid beta plaques were the causative factor in Alzheimer's. So, and, and it turns out that's not the case. So all the drugs that they've tried to make in the last 20 years have all been total failures because everybody got completely sidetracked by their papers. Um, they also got about two, over 20 years, two billion dollars in research money from the NIH, which is fraud. They defrauded the federal government and that's what I think they're going to go to jail on. Um, they haven't been charged with any crimes yet, but I hope they do. Uh, because that's really, really egregious. I, f I feel like they've wasted my taxpayer money uh, and, de and, and just derailed Alzheimer's research for 20 years. We're, we're back to 2000 now in Alzheimer's research. Uh, it's, it, it, people are, other scientists are really angry about this. That, at, but that's how they caught it. They caught it because their experiments were not repeatable. Uh, and that happened for years. Their experiments were not repeatable, and somebody finally figured out, oh, here's why, because they just made it up. Um, so their papers have been withdrawn. Uh, papers get withdrawn if there are too many problems with them. Um, so testing a hypothesis. Uh, 
so how do we do that? What qualifies as testing? Um, one of the hypotheses at the beginning of the 20th century was that smoking was somehow causing lung cancer. Uh, when cigarettes, factory rolled cigarettes, first came on the market in the late 1800s, about 20 years later, there was a huge increase in lung cancer, which was a very rare cancer before that, in men. And uh, the reason there wasn't an increase in women is because women rarely smoked cigarettes early on in the 20th century. Uh, so we can see a very strong correlation here. It starts in 1900 and goes to 1980. Big increase in cigarette consumption. Um, cigarette smoke per person per year is the y-axis here. And then the red line is uh, lung cancer deaths per 100,000 people. So uh, that's a pretty startling correlation. But that still doesn't prove cause and effect, and the um, tobacco companies successfully argued for decades that it was something else, that it was a lifestyle thing, that these men who got lung cancer, they lived in urban areas, they were coal miners, they worked in factories and were exposed to other things, and it was something else other than the smoking, because this, this is what we call positive correlation, both things increasing together, um, but that just gives us a hypothesis. The hypothesis being that smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer. Um, here's another study that was done a slightly different way. Uh, this graph is on the y-axis here is the risk that lung cancer will be the cause of death. And you can see it goes from 0 to 20% chance. So at the high, it's a 20% chance that lung cancer will be the cause of death. And then we have People who smoked until they died, that's the blue line. Uh, former smokers, so people who quit at some point in their life before they died. And then never smokers are the light blue line here. Then we have ages on the x-axis. So if you live to be in your 70s and you are still a smoker, your chances that lung cancer will be the cause of your death is about 19%. So that means 80% of them were dying of something else, probably heart disease or something. Uh, there's many other things smoking related. And the never smokers, your chance of dying of lung cancer was about 1%. And former smokers are somewhere in between. This is something that we call a dosage effect in correlation. And this adds to the credibility of the hypothesis when we see a dosage effect. So people who smoked less had less lung cancer. So that is a good indication that our hypothesis may be correct, but it's still not an experiment. It's just surveying people and seeing that two things correlate together. So this wasn't enough evidence to prove that. So experiments had to be done to show how smoking caused cancer. Uh, Lots of things can correlate together, and there isn't any cause and effect there. Uh, correlation studies are, are published all the time, and many of them are misleading. So a positive correlation is both things increase together. A negative correlation is one increases as the other one decreases. Like uh, there's a negative correlation between seatbelt use and road deaths. So as seatbelt use increased after 1980, road deaths from car accidents went down. So that would be a negative correlation. Um, here's a very misleading correlation. So you can make almost any two things correlate if you make your y-axis correctly. So this shows that uh, from 1997 to 2009 that there was an increase in sales of organic food, and there was also an increase in autism diagnoses. So uh, very, very lovely correlation there because we set these y-axis so that these two lines will line up almost perfectly. But does that mean organic food causes autism? Of course it doesn't. Uh, that is a very misleading correlation. So just because two things seem to correlate, there may be another explanation. Uh, one of my favorite false uh, correlation studies was published in the 1980s. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year, like 87 or 88. And the study, they surveyed coffee drinkers and asked them about which diseases they had. 
and they found a very strong correlation between drinking regular coffee and whether that person had ever been diagnosed with lung cancer. They did not find a correlation between lung cancer and drinking decaf or lung cancer and drinking tea. Now this was Americans. You probably would find something different if you studied uh, the Brits, for example. Uh, so decaf was not associated with lung cancer. So there was stories on the news. It's like, oh my gosh, caffeine causes lung cancer. Everybody should stop drinking coffee and switch to decaf. And um, I was working in a research lab at the time, and we all heard this story. Of course, we all are big coffee drinkers. Uh, and we all thought immediately what the problem with this study is. So they're just surveying people. But they didn't eliminate a particular group from the study. Um, they didn't eliminate smokers. And so what they did find something interesting. What they found is that smokers drink regular coffee, not decaf. Uh, because when they took the smokers out of the study, the correlation disappeared. So no, coffee drinking does not cause lung cancer. Uh, but uh, smoking cigarettes causes coffee drinking. Um, some other correlational studies uh, that were later disproved by experiments. Um, there was uh, the Framingham the survey study you may have heard about. It. It's been going on for like 40 years. Uh, town in Framingham, Framingham, Massachusetts. They have about half the town participating in this study that's been going on for decades. They bring them in once a year. They have them fill out food surveys. They weigh them. They take their blood pressure. They find out what prescriptions they're on. And when they die, you know, they're replaced by somebody else. Um, and in the 90s, uh, scraping through the Framingham study the data that they had, they found that people who said they drank eight glasses of water a day and people who said they took a multivitamin every day live longer. And they, and they were like, oh, look at that. Everybody should drink water and take a vitamin. But in the 2000s, they did ex an actual experiment. Uh, that lasted for five years, and they it was two separate experiments, one for the water, where they gave people water, and they said, drink, you know, drink your eight glasses of water a day, and they had a control group that didn't, that was just told, drink whatever you want, and the vitamin group, they actually used a placebo vitamin, so half the people got a real vitamin, and half the people got a placebo vitamin, and they found that neither thing had any effect on any health conditions whatsoever. So drinking eight glasses of water a day had no effect on any diseases or longevity or BMI or anything, and neither did taking a multivitamin. Did nothing uh, in, this, in these uh, experimental studies. So what's the difference here? What happened? Why, what is, so we have to ask here, what is different about people who would deliberately drink eight glasses of water a day or take a multivitamin every day? What? Because this is a self-selected group. It wasn't a, initially the survey study, the Framingham study. It's not an experiment. They just ask people what they do. Um, and this is something we now call healthy user bias. Uh, people who are health conscious are far more likely to participate in any kind of a survey, so even in the Framingham study, people who are already interested in healthy behaviors are way more likely to say, yes, I'll be in the study, uh, which already makes the results dubious because the people we would most want in the study are all the people with the unhealthy behaviors, but they choose mostly not to participate in the study. So healthy users, as we call them, do a lot of things differently than the general population. Uh, they tend to eat more vegetables. They eat less red meat. They drink less beer, but more wine. They drink more water. They take vitamins. They exercise more. They take their prescriptions as directed. What a difference that makes if people take their blood pressure medicine or sometimes take their blood pressure medicine, for example. Uh, they follow doctor's instructions. If the doctor tells them to that they should start walking and walk a half an hour a day, they do it. Uh, they get medical attention if they're sick. So this problem that we have people in these, these survey studies that aren't an experiment, we have all of these healthy users in there. So if you're studying, for example, does eating broccoli make you healthier? And then we just survey people. 
who's eating the most broccoli? The healthy users. So people who are already doing all these other things. So if we find at the end of the study that the people who ate more broccoli were healthier, that tells us nothing because it's just, a, it, they're doing all these other things and we don't know which of those things is the specific thing that's doing it, if anything. So when they do those as an experiment, um, this experiment was done in um, uh, Britain. They decided to test the five to 10 servings of vegetables a day thing. So they gave people vegetables to eat in the experimental group. They said, you eat all these vegetables, we're going to give you free vegetables and we want you to eat more vegetables. You got to eat five to 10 servings a day of fruit and vegetables. And then the control group, they just told them to eat whatever they wanted. They didn't give them vegetables. Um, and after many years, they found no difference between the groups and their health. So when you actually do an experiment, a lot of these things that are supposed to be healthy turn out to just be healthy user bias. So if you hear that something is correlated with health, you can go look up the study and we'll find out how to do that and find out, was it just a survey or did they actually do an experiment? Um, because the most uh, the cheapest kind of research to do with, especially in nutrition, uh, isn't what we call an epidemiological study. That's a survey. Uh, surveys, uh, epidemiological studies are super cheap. You just mail it out to people uh, or bring them in and, uh, you know, like the Framingham study is an epidemiological study. We can find out a lot of great information from those and form hypotheses, but we can't determine cause and effect from that alone. Because we people pick their own groups, uh, and so they're not random. And so we don't know if there's something else in that person's lifestyle that's responsible for the results that we see. Uh, laboratory studies are a little bit more expensive, so they're less... Uh, or with human cells and culture. These can prove cause and effect, but we have to be careful about generalizing it to advice for humans. Uh, I saw a news story a few years ago that said um, uh, that there was a one of the fatty acids in canola oil was associated with uh, early death, in, 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 um, and so everybody should stop using it. And I looked at the study, and the study wasn't with people, it was with nematodes, which are these guys right here, these tiny little worms, uh, C. elegans. And so they gave these uh, C. elegans this one particular fatty acid and they didn't live as long and they said, oh, where's that fatty acid in the human diet? Oh, it's in canola oil, so everybody should stop eating that. It's like, how can you generalize that? Don't do that. That's not that's not good. We, we should also study it in humans. So. Um, and you can look those up yourself, and it's usually not the scientists making those jumps. It's usually the, the news people who are doing that. Um, the most expensive kind of study is a clinical trial because you have to have, uh, there's ethical constraints. You're actually doing an experiment. You have to randomize people. Um, it, they go on for months or years. Uh, and this is the best way, though, to determine cause and effect. Clinical trials are how all of our prescription drugs are tested uh, because this is the best way to test them. Now, there are limits. Anything that's generally considered unhealthy, like smoking, we can't do a clinical trial because ideally, you know, if you're going to do a clinical trial with smoking, you would have to take, you know, a bunch of teenagers, divide them up randomly and say, okay, this group, you're going to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. This group, don't smoke and we'll come back in 30 years and see how sick you are. That would be considered unethical. We can't do that. So there are some things that we can't do with that. But that's the best. If you if you hear about something and you look it up and it was actually a clinical trial with a placebo control, that's much more believable than a survey. Uh, so for smoking, because we can't do those kind of experiments with humans, they did experiments with monkeys and dogs to show that cigarette smoke caused cancer. They, of course, have a much shorter lifespan, too, so you can find get your results in five or six years instead of waiting 50 years to find out the results. Uh, we now know the mechanism. There's a lot of chemicals in cigarette smoke that cause DNA mutations, and DNA mutations are the first step to the formation of cancerous cells, which we'll talk about later in the semester. 
Uh, and it's now been shown that you can turn human cells in culture cancerous by exposing them to liquefied cigarette smoke. So we now have all the steps of the process, and those were all finally finished by the early 1970s. And by the late 1970s, that's when warning labels started to be required on cigarette packages. So, uh, I mean, this is extremely well-established science now. Um, so I mentioned uh, using placebo-controlled clinical trials. That would be considered evidence-based medicine. This is a new phrase that's been around for about 20 years, evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is the opposite of anecdotal results. So an anecdote is a little story. So an anecdotal result is somebody's result. Um, you could also consider them testimonials. So a, an anecdotal result would be, for example, if uh, somebody said, oh yeah, my grandma tried this supplement and her memory's better. Okay, that's not an experiment. Uh, we need to actually do a clinical trial to determine if that is effective. And sometimes um, herbs that have been used for hundreds of years turn out to be effective, and sometimes they turn out not to be effective. St. John's wort used to be a really popular over-the-counter herbal treatment for depression, but in uh, 1990s, somebody did a really good placebo-controlled trial with St. John's wort. Not any better than placebo, so you don't hear about it anymore. Uh, so sometimes they turn out to be effective, sometimes not. But we don't know just from testimonials. That doesn't tell us anything. And it doesn't matter if it's been used for hundreds or a thousand years. If nobody has done a placebo-controlled trial, we don't know if it works because the placebo effect is very strong. Uh, so when we say it's evidence-based medicine, we mean that we use the scientific method. Uh, we want a large study, preferably with thousands of people, but if it doesn't have at least a few hundred people, it's very suspect. If a study only has 10 people in it, it who knows it, it, what, it, what it could be. Uh, controlled study, and that means that we had a control group, preferably with a placebo if we're talking about people, because people will try to figure out whether they're in the control group or not. Um, and double blind, we want double blind. So what does that mean? So uh, double blind means that uh, the patient doesn't know whether they're in the control group or not. They don't know if they're getting the placebo or the real medicine. But it also means that any medical person who deals directly with the patient, they also don't know who's in the control group. There are always scientists behind the scenes who know who's in the control group and they monitor the results because sometimes a trial has to be stopped early, either because of side effects or uh, because it's working really well and they're gonna put some people from the control group into the experimental group. Um, but anybody who deals directly with the patients does not know if it's a, if who is in the placebo group and who is in the treatment group. And the patients themselves also don't know. Uh, that's double blind. Um, do all over-the-counter treatments work? No, they don't. And Airborne, uh, which has been around since the 90s, uh, actually, Band has been around since the 80s, um, it's got, so if you've never seen it, it's like an Alka-Seltzer. It's like a little effervescent tablet that you put in water and it fizzes. And it has a bunch of stuff in there which is generally considered to be good for colds like um, echinacea and vitamin C and zinc and some amino acids. Uh, and it was advertised uh, as um, shortening the duration of colds and preventing colds. Initially, when it first came on the market, they would say, oh yes, take this before you get on an airplane and you won't get sick. Or take it at the first sign of a cold and you'll get well faster. So there was a class action, and it's not cheap. This stuff's like $20, $25 a box. Uh, there was a class action lawsuit in, I think, 1998, 1999. Um, and the judge in the case made the company do a trial. They made them do a placebo-controlled trial, and they made them make the placebo so it looked like they were the same tablets. They made them, you know, little effervescent-flavored tablets. 
and there was no difference between the placebo and the treatment group. So their airborne is completely ineffective. It's a placebo. Uh, and so the, they were forced to give out um, uh, awards. Uh, it, all the people in the class action lawsuit got thousands of dollars each, and they had to change their labels. And so now it says, are you sick of getting sick when traveling? Sick of catching colds? See, it's not actually making a medical claim. It's letting you jump to the conclusion. They have these pictures of, I don't know if these are supposed to be viruses, what those are, uh, and there's somebody coughing on a plane, uh, and it just says to use in these places, but it doesn't make any medical claims anymore. So be careful of that. If you see that, like a package that doesn't actually make any medical claims, and it just says, for for the for uh, respiratory support or for a digestion or something really vague, they probably don't have any evidence that it actually does anything. Um, sometimes older treatments that were around before we did clinical trials, I kind of got grandfathered in, um, and when they actually do clinical trials, sometimes they fail. Uh, so we've only been doing placebo-controlled clinical trials since the late 60s, early 70s, and there are a lot of things that have been around before that. So Tylenol uh, was the first aspirin alternative, and it came on the market, I think, in the 1950s uh, because it doesn't cause bleeding the way aspirin does. So people who had bleeding disorders or were uh, possibly could have ulcers could take it. And it, Tylenol is really effective as a fever reducer, but they never did a clinical trial for pain. So somebody did one in 2017 and they tested extra strength Tylenol for arthritis pain. So they had a large number of people, I can't remember how many hundreds, of people who have arthritis who normally, you know, take something for their arthritis pain. Half of them got extra strength Tylenol, half of them got a placebo. There was no difference between the groups. Uh, so Tylenol, it, there is still some claims that it's an effective um, adjuvant with opiate pain medicine. So Tylenol is often combined with opiate pain medicines. It's supposed to make them better. I haven't been able to find a good trial, though, that compares the opiate medicine by itself and the, against the opiate medicine plus the Tylenol to see if there's any difference. I haven't been able to find such a study. Um, there used to be a cough medicine called Triaminic, children's cough syrup. It had been around since the early 1900s. It had never been tested in a trial. And it had an ingredient. There's a new formulation now that doesn't have this ingredient in it. Um, up until the 90s, it had an ingredient in it that could cause heart arrhythmias in children. And after there were several deaths uh, because children overdosed on it, like drank the bottle because it's syrup, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics demanded that they do a trial. And so they did a placebo-controlled trial where they had one placebo was uh, the triaminic flavored syrup without the active ingredient. And they did a second placebo, which was honey, which is like a you know common folk remedy for cough. And in that study with those three groups, honey was the most effective. Honey was more effective than the triaminic with or without the active ingredient. So it was taken off the market. The American Academy of Pediatrics said, take it off the market because it doesn't improve anyone's cough. And it's killing a few kids a year when they drink the whole bottle. Um, so now it's back out again. It's reformulated, though. Uh, they used to do a knee surgery for arthritis, um, where they, if you had bad knee arthritis, they would open up your knee, scrape out all the arthritis, sew you back up. It's done on tens of thousands of people. And for surgery, what do you think the placebo is for surgery? Because remember, we don't want people to know that they're in the control group. Uh, the placebo for surgery is called a sham surgery. So they cut cut you open and sew you back up. Don't actually do the surgery. So they did a sham controlled study for this popular knee surgery, and it turned out it was not effective. It did it was no the people were no better in than the controls. Now of course we do knee replacement, 
for the same thing. And that's really effective. And they actually did do a sham control for that, and it passed really well. So knee replacement, really good. Scraping out the arthritis, not good. Um, stents, uh, heart stents for stable coronary arteries. Um, stents were originally um, used for people having a heart attack, and they still are. Now, if you go to the emergency room and you're in the middle of having a heart attack, you're going to go to the stent lab. Um, or the cath lab, as they call it, and they're probably going to put a stent in and open that artery back up and save you from heart damage. Really effective. They have done sham surgery controls for that, and it's very effective. Uh, so cardiologists said, hey, why are we waiting for people to have a heart attack? Let's put stents in uh, when people just have narrowed coronary arteries. And different doctors have different limits for how narrow they are when they'll put a stent in. Um, they've done four sham surgery controlled trials uh, for putting stents in stable coronary arteries, and all four of them showed no difference in outcomes uh, as far as future heart attacks, longevity, that kind of thing, pain, angina, all that was the same uh, overall in the two groups. So. Uh, so this is controversial among cardiologists uh, still. Uh, but four, four studies have been done. Four sham studies have been done uh, or sham controlled studies. Uh, so stents if you're having a heart attack, great. It's probably save your life. Um, stents for stable coronary arteries, do a little research. Uh, okay, 